patient hearing and I'm very uh, thank you very much for asking me to speak on the immune system and diabetes clinical implications. And this kind of carries on from where Shujo has left off. Uh, the problem with the diabetes cyst, uh, can I have the slides please? system and uh, though this chap wants to have the thing work only on the weekdays and not on the weekends, in diabetes it seems that there is a vicious cycle of diabetes and hyperglycemia which impairs innate immunity, which impairs humoral immunity, which impairs T cell function and impairs cytokine function which along with problems like neuropathy which makes sensation of any kind of infect, a, a injury or any kind of stress response or poor diet, uh, adequate insulin therapy and hyperglycemic effect being worsened by antibiotics and corticosteroids makes infections become even worse than they were originally supposed to be. But why is that? Because different immune functions found in diabetes patients the innate immunity, 
the adaptive immunity or the adherence are all worsened by diabetes. There is a re in reduction of complements, there's a reduction, increase of cytokines without stimulation and a reduction of cytokines after stimulation. Immunoglobulins are not changed. Polymorphonuclear leukocytes do not work very well. Monocytes and macrophages do not have the similar power of swallowing up microorganisms as they did. And T lymphocytes do not remember to kill off the uh, anti, uh, microbes like they would normally be found. And this leads to viral infections. I think viral infections are very topical now. Viral infections can cause pancreatitis with reduced beta cell function, and that leads to type 2 diabetes. And viral infection can also cause immune activation, which leads to the release of cytokines like TNF-alpha, like interferon gamma and IL-6. And these work on the muscle and the liver, worsening insulin resistance, which further pressurizes the pancreas to produce more insulin. And this over-secretion of insulin leads to even more immune activation, making viral infection so much more dangerous in diabetes. In bacterial infections, what happens is the sugar molecule binds with protein to increase advanced glycation end products, and obesity, dyslipidemia, circulating free fatty acids, all these things, they all kind of combine, they kind of uh, connive to get together and lead to malfunctioning of the neutrophils. And what does this malfunctioning of the neutrophils lead to? It leads to, on one hand, impaired bacterial clearance, and on the other hand, inflammation and tissue damage. The in impaired bacterial clearance is mainly due to reduction of uh, phagocytosis, and also due to reduction of chemotaxis and intracellular ROS being coming down. The neutrophil phenotype also leads to apoptosis of the cells and increase in pro-inflammatory cytokine productions and extracellular ROS. So all these worsens the inflammation that an infection causes and worsens the tissue that it is affected by the uh, bacterial infection. Not surprising, we have major infections associated with diabetes, respiratory infection, pneumonia is more common, influenza, tuberculosis, urinary tract infections, gastrointestinal infections, including H. pylori. We get fungal infections of the gut. We get skin and soft tissue infections, like foot infection, which is very common. There is chance of necrotizing fasciitis and furnia's gangrene. And also, we've recently been exposed to mucormycosis and HIV. Now, this is uh, taken from a paper which was before COVID hit our country, but it is no doubt, even before COVID hit, infections were one of the leading causes of death in people with diabetes, which includes infections not affecting the lungs and also includes people who get pneumonia to the tune of 67% higher of incidence of death in pneumonia from diabetes and about two and a half times death in people with diabetes without, uh, compared to people without diabetes. Now, this is a quantification, and this is a retrospective co cohort. Almost half of all people with diabetes will have one hospitalization for, uh, for infection-related uh, problems. This is about two times normal, and death is also increased in people with diabetes. So diabetes in itself confers an increased risk of developing and dying from an infectious disease. And this translates into not only an increased risk of hospitalization, which is increased two to six times, it also increases the cost of therapy. And in India, this is a very important thing because 50% of the cost of therapy of diabetes is attributed to infections due to immune failure that we see. In fact, people who get hospitalized for diabetes have a 27% chance of reinfection um, among those readmitted, 87%. So these are not people who are coming for a routine lap coli or something like that. These are people who get readmitted again with a different illness again. We come to COVID, and there is evidence that pre-existing diabetes is associated with an increased risk of having severe and critical COVID il illness and a three times increased risk of in-hospital mortality. 
this meta-analysis shows that severity and mortality is very largely increased in patients with diabetes when compared to non-diabetics due to the immune failure, the inability to clear out the virus that I showed you uh, a little while ago. Pre-infection glycemic control and disease severity among patients with type 2 diabetes and COVID-19. This is quite a seminal paper because there's no uh, prospective data as of now. And as you can see, uh, the increase in HbA1c is associated with worsening of immune function and increased risk of severe COVID-19. So it's almost an inflection point that if patients have a HbA1c of more than 7.9%, their chances of developing uh, COVID-19 becomes much more, almost exponentially higher than people without COVID. And not only is that the case, the opposite of it. So if you reduce the glycemia, if you reduce the glycemia by as little as 0.21%, uh, you get a reduction of 21% risk of developing co severe co a reduction of 1% will reduce 21% risk of get getting severe COVID or COVID-related death. Another important aspect is tuberculosis, particularly in our country, but let us just put it into perspective. Even in the United States of America, one out of five people with TB has diabetes. So this is another infection which is very important because they are very strongly in, in, in interrelated, one worsening the other. Tuberculosis worsens diabetes control, and diabetes worsens tuberculosis with reduced cellular immunity, worsening of all the, the infection-fighting uh, cytokines, and also in tuberculosis, the stress response to infection is worsened with increased interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and TNF-alpha. There is also TB, pancreatitis. All in all, this leads to one making the other situation worse. So there is two things that can are known to improve uh, tuberculosis, uh, tuberculosis and outcomes. Statins reduce the risk of active TB and reduces the redu TB severity. Metformin also reduces the risk of primary infection, risks of active TB, and also reduces TB severity. In fact, weight loss that is associated with metformin is also associated with an improvement in immune response, which in turn improves the outcomes of tuberculosis. So I'll move on to another area which I think is important, which is vaccination, and I think this is something that we've been missing out on. I think is particularly important for these people who are completely uh, immunostunned to have proper vaccination. Pneumococcal vaccine for everybody in the age group of 2 to 64. Influenza vaccine, that, that is just once in a lifetime and a booster shot at the age of 65. Influenza vaccine every year, pr preferably the quadrivalent vaccine. Hepatitis B vaccine, two or three series. These are must for all patients with diabetes and all other vaccines should be given, including the COVID-19 vaccine. I thought there's one other area which I will address before I let you go. And one thing that is definitely associated with worsening glycemia is immune response. And this is why a lot of surgeons tend to not want to operate. Now, if you look at the surgical guidelines, there is no reason not to operate on a patient when they have glycemia in the range of 200 or 300. In fact, the surgical guidelines actually say that you should be careful only if a patient has a, a blood sugar level of 400 or 500, and anything less than that is good enough for a patient to be operated on. And in these situations, there is no kind of worsening of glycemic control. Thank you very much for listening to me.